Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy are your new Raw Tag Team Champions. Rusev loses again to Bobby Lashley, and everyone declares that they're going to win the Royal Rumble. It is Rumble Week, so we're going to get it started, and your Monday Night Raw review is going to get going right after this message from our sponsor. Hey guys, so retirement may or may not be something that you're really thinking about, but even if you are years and years away, I mean, I'm 20 years away from retirement, but it's something that we should all be thinking about. There's a company that has retirement plans that you can invest in precious metals like gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. There's also a big opportunity to grow retirement and grow income for either your personal or, um, or a business. And anyone who signs up at this website receives a free investment kit and gift. So what is this website? It's brightmoneyinvestments.com. That's brightmoneyinvestments.com. You can diversify and grow with metals and cryptos, and you can even talk to someone there to get a better idea of what you should be investing in. So head on over to brightmoneyinvestments.com. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. Your place for the most passionate wrestling analysis on the web. Just turn Roman heel. What is WWE waiting for? When other wrestling podcasts put you to sleep, you can count on the WWE Podcast to keep you engaged and asking for more. I've been watching wrestling for over 20 years, and that was one of the best matches I've ever seen. This is unlike any other wrestling analysis. So without any further delay, let's get the show started right now. All right, guys, welcome to the WWE Podcast. Thank you for joining me on this Tuesday, January 21st. 2019 or 2020 man where did that 2019 come from i'll get used to it you figure i would have gotten past that by now but it is january 21st 2020 so guys thank you for joining me and those of you who are watching on video welcome uh that video is exclusive to patreon members so if you'd like this raw review video podcast head on over to patreon.com slash wwe podcast and you can get yourself a great look at this podcast in a way that you haven't before because you can see it being recorded in front of your very eyes. There's no net. There's no safety net. Um, and that's pretty stressful on me because typically I will have a lot of flubs, blubs, yawns, coughs. So we're going to see what happens because uh, this is in audio form being duplicated in video form. So uh, there will be no safety net for me tonight. So um, those of you on video, you may be in for a treat. All right, well, thank you guys for joining me on this Royal Rumble Week. It is the Rumble Week. It's my favorite pay-per-view of the year. I don't think that I am being unique in saying that. Um, I think that a lot of wrestling fans feel that same way, and uh, I think that the marathon format of WrestleMania is the reason, one of the big reasons, that many don't say WrestleMania is their favorite, even though it's the culmination of the year's worth of work, although WWE does not exactly think long, long term. Um, It is the culmination of a year's worth of work, in quotes, but it is the biggest event of the year, but it has become such a long damn show that it has really started to uh, cannibalize itself. And the Royal Rumble event is the kickoff to Mania, uh, the road to WrestleMania. It is also the Royal Rumble match itself, which is one of the most brilliant, ingenious, fun, entertaining match formats that has ever been created in the history of professional wrestling. Um, it's just exciting. The countdown always refreshes things. And uh, when the match starts to feel a little bit boring, you just never know when that buzzer goes down, who's coming out next. Um, there have been rumors flying about going crazy this week of who could be returning who could be uh, debuting and uh, I don't think that I I don't think that there's a whole lot of secrets left right now in WWE Um, the big one I'll just tell you right off the bat I don't think CM Punk will be involved in the Royal Rumble match I just don't doesn't make sense I've already explained why in many many previous podcasts Um, I still believe there could be a massive return and one of edge he's probably the most likely if he were to return, but uh, we will take a, a stronger look at that as we get into the prediction show later this week. And a real possibility of Brock Lesnar winning, maybe even Drew McIntyre after his uh, interaction with Randy Orton in his match this week. Um, lots to think about there, you know. Brock Lesnar winning the Rumble, 
I don't think it's so far-fetched. They are investing a lot of time in Brock Lesnar over the last few weeks, telling people that he's going to commit number one and win the whole damn thing, right? So could it be feasible that he actually wins the Royal Rumble match? Yes, is the answer. Because what happens next? Paul Heyman has never addressed what happens if Brock wins. Who does he face, right? You would think that he would face the only champion that he can, and that's likely Bray Wyatt, not Daniel Bryan. This wouldn't make sense. In the unlikely scenario Brock wins, he would have to face the um, the, the universal champion, and that would be F- the Fiend. Um, that's a match I would love to see. I think it's a match that we deserve to see and will see, but is it going to be this year is the question. I think the answer is no. I think the answer is no, but it's an outside chance. I'd say 5% chance. Um, I think the most likely scenario that we get, and and this is not a prediction show, but I just, I want to reiterate it because many people have been asking me if I've been waffling or um, modifying my picks. The answer is no. Um, I still think the most likely scenario is Roman Reigns winning the Rumble, but my confidence on that is starting to wane. And the reason is because if, Royal, if uh, Roman Reigns wins the Rumble, then that means, number one, there's a lot of, there's potential for backlash from fans of resurfacing all of the negativity from 2015, really 2016. Um, there, there's a lot of, there's a potential there and a risk that they don't need to take to have Roman Reigns win outside of just adding another accolade to his resume of, of winning the Royal Rumble multiple times. Um, but you run the risk of from January 26, uh, hold on, 27th, this coming Sunday, until WrestleMania in early April of us anticipating him versus The Fiend. Because let's face it, Daniel Bryan, in all likelihood, not winning against the fiend, right? I, I think I don't think that I am uh, spoiling things, as Heyman would like to say. I believe that uh, you have Brock Lesnar, or I'm sorry, um, you have Daniel Bryan lose to the fiend, and then you have Roman Reigns win the Rumble. That sets up a potentially two and a half month long program between the two, and a lot of potential for resentment. So I think. What what the smarter choice would be is to have Roman Reigns not win the Rumble and find his path to WrestleMania through the Elimination Chamber and the event at Saudi Arabia that precedes that. Uh, so I think that's how you do it. And then you get Roman Reigns versus The Fiend in which you have a four-week build or five-week build. And then from there, you go into WrestleMania, Fiend versus Reigns. And then you just... So there's there's minimal time that fans can turn on this. That's how I would do it. And so that leaves the question, if Reigns doesn't win the Rumble and they take the safe road and not try to stir up old bad memories and they're still looking at and aiming towards the Fiend versus Roman Reigns and he has his own path, because remember there's two, that leaves the question and begs the question, who wins the Royal Rumble match? Is it Brock Lesnar? Is it Randy Orton? Is it... Uh, Kevin Owens? Is it Samoa Joe? Is it Drew McIntyre? Those are some real, real true candidates there. If Rowan Reigns indeed is not going to be taking the Royal Rumble path to WrestleMania and carving his own to the main event, of course. But that begs the question, right? And and honestly, I, I haven't thought too much about this in a realistic fashion where I can give an intelligent answer. I, there's been many signs pointing this week to Drew McIntyre, right? They've been recently building Drew McIntyre. It hasn't been a long-standing, uh, a long-standing foundational build and slow burn for Drew. It's been on again, off again, on again, off again, on, and we're in the on phase right now. So it doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence that they're truly getting behind Drew McIntyre, but it is encouraging and he's getting hot at the right time and he's getting uh, positioned at the right time. Although he did get cut out of the Hulu version of uh, raw this week. I had to go back and watch that match with Randy Orton this week 
um, on a separate feed because Hulu cut it out, which means that if it was cut out of the Hulu feed, that maybe we don't need to read too much into it. And typically only the important things are on the 90 minute version, but that could be completely reading too much into it. So Drew, could he win? Absolutely. And I would love to see it. Could Kevin Owens win? Yeah, he could. Although he has certainly cooled off. He could win. I think he's got about the same chance as Samoa Joe does. And uh, that's not a great chance. I put both of them at 10% chances apiece. We have Randy Orton. I put it about 5% chance. Because I don't think that that's a smart move. It's just not. Right? Randy Orton's not at that point in his career where he needs to be in the Royal Rumble mix in terms of winning the Royal... I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Right? He'll be good for a couple of RKO's. Some nice moments in the Rumble of facing off against Lesnar. Although we've seen that. it's I mean, we saw that at SummerSlam a number of years ago where he busted open Randy Orton and Jericho got mad. Um, and if you haven't seen that match, by, by the way, go see it. Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, SummerSlam. Uh, just freaking put it in the WWE Network or YouTube it. So there are some candidates that make sense. There are some candidates you can make a case for. Um, and again, this is all assuming that Roman Reigns is taking his own path to WrestleMania, to the main event of WrestleMania facing The Fiend, which is where we all know he's going. We all know Roman Reigns is going to The Fiend at Rumble, or at uh, WrestleMania. I think that, that is a pretty safe assumption. And that's fine. That's fine with me, um, because I think that is really the only place that Roman can go. He has nowhere else to go on SmackDown. And no one else really can be positioned as champion on SmackDown. Outside of Daniel Bryan, there's not a whole lot. There's really not not a whole lot of things that you can do with that roster right now. It's in need, in desperate need of main eventers. And I think maybe this is the time you start getting other people hot and start building new stars because right now the depth on SmackDown is about as thick as this pen that I'm holding up, right? It's not great. So Reigns and Fiend are on a collision course. And that's fine. I, I, it's not that I don't want to see the match. I'm just anti-babyface Roman winning the belt. That's, that, that will be a forever answer that I have. Um, but anyway, um, so welcome to the show. That was a huge long open I, did, I wasn't expecting to get that in-depth in my picks already and my thoughts, but I, I really don't have an official pick for who's going to win the Rumble. Again, taking Roman and putting him aside and and, and just benching him as, as, a, as a candidate because he's so obvious. Um, I think, and, and putting him, it really kind of, putting him on the sidelines because he's the obvious pick. He's the heavy favorite. He's the guy that everybody thinks is going to win the rumble. And rightfully so there's a big strong case to be made for Roman Reigns winning the Royal rumble match simply because it makes sense. And we haven't seen Roman win the rumble since 2015. And it's been five years, although it feels like that Philly incident was yesterday and I will never forget it. But uh, so it's the conversation really is when you take Roman out of it, who would win? Who would win? And and I'll give you guys my official pick. Not that I'm trying to string you along, but, but because I don't have it yet. It's going to be coming on the Saturday and or Sunday. I'm not sure which one. Whatever day works best for our, our schedules, myself and Ashley, who's going to be the co-host for the official Royal Rumble preview show. Um, we're going to be talking this weekend and giving our Royal Rumble predictions. So I'm going to wait until then to make my pick because we still have a SmackDown to go on Friday and plus news that could be coming out of the wire and rumors floating around. It's just a great time to be a wrestling fan. I mean, there's just there's nothing like it, right? Even in this era of social media and things being leaked, it's still a great time to be a wrestling fan because it, you know what's coming around the corner, right? You know WrestleMania is now in the sights of WWE. And it's time to start speculating. It's time to start looking. It's time to start giving those fantasy matchups and what ifs and who could return and what could happen and possible injury returns and debuts. It's an exciting effing time to be a wrestling fan. That's what this is about right now. And I expect the show quality to continue. Um, and at least on Monday Night Raw's end, which has been nothing short of 
very good. I'm not going to say great. Good to very good on a strong, um, consistent basis. And that's the key was consistency. So I'm, I've been enjoying Raw for the most part. And we're going to get into all the details of the things I liked. And, oh, don't worry, the things I didn't. Because there were quite a bit of things uh, that I didn't like. Overall, though, I'd give it a thumbs up show. Just some of the WTF moments that just continue to plague WWE that I'm going to get into, of course. Um, but first, guys, if you haven't joined me before, thank you. This is the WWE podcast, the unofficial WWE podcast. I have to say that legally. And uh, thank you for joining me as we continue to pump out shows this week and cover everything that you need to, including tomorrow, which starts my Wrestling Nostalgia three-part series. The very first part of my three-part that's going to cover the Rock versus Austin rivalry, right? From the WrestleMania 15 event to WrestleMania 17 to WrestleMania 19. That was the final match of Austin's career. This is going to be a three-part series. I'm really excited to be diving into this rivalry that I haven't ever really touched on. Amazingly, amazingly, I haven't touched the, on this entire um, program. So I'm excited to do part one tomorrow night that will cover the Rock versus Austin at WrestleMania 15. And then on Thursday and Friday will be AEW and NXT. And then Saturday and or Sunday will be the uh, official Royal Rumble preview show. And then next week, it's going to get nuts because at obviously we had the Royal Rumble ma- event on Sunday. Um, so that actually begged, no, this, this show with Ashley has to be on Saturday. Duh, right? Boy, I'm not even like using my brain tonight, guys. I'm extremely tired. But I'm pumping through here because it's rumble season. I'm I'm on uh, on fumes. That's okay. That's okay. I'm here. Um, so the the match, or I'm sorry, the Royal Rumble preview show will be Saturday with Ashley. The Royal Rumble event Sunday, which I will be live tweeting throughout the entire show. Yes, I'm actually going to be watching the damn thing live. I've been a really bad habit of not watching things live. And uh, that will not be the case because I will have the time. I've carved out the time. I have already given my wife a heads up. Hey, this is the biggest, I, I kind of sold it as like the biggest event of the year, even though she knows WrestleMania is. I sold it like it is. And and you know what? It is, right? So everyone just kind of, shh, just keep my, keep my, keep my uh, schedule a secret. Um, but that's what's going to be happening. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. And you guys can follow my comments if you want to talk about what just happened. And boy, there's going to be a lot of stuff to discuss. Um, hit me up at the WWE podcast on Twitter, which is at the underscore WWE underscore podcast. There is somebody out there that has just the WWE podcast and they must be getting a whole bunch of followers because I'm thinking that people probably go and search that and go, Oh, that must be him. And it's not me. Right. Um, but nonetheless, uh, follow me there. You can also hit up the website at WWE podcast.com where, uh, blogs are going up. And content's going up. These podcasts are there. Video is going to be coming soon. There's a video section already created. I just haven't put much in there um, simply because of time. <laughs> I'm a one-man show run on the website. So uh, that is going to be something that is uh, it's structurally there. I just haven't put the content in. And then, by the way, as, as I mentioned at the top of the show, patreon.com slash WWE podcast is where you'll get this video feed for every Monday Night Raw review that is exclusive only to the Patreon members. And, of course, you get a couple of exclusive blogs that were published there that weren't available to the public, as well as a shout-out on the show. And um, you also get uh, some other exclusive content. And you can even come on the show. There's a uh, an option to come on the show as well. So, uh by the way, I would like to make a shout out to our latest patron of the show, Christian. So thank you so much. Uh, you are awesome. So I hope you enjoy enjoy the uh, the benefits of an ad free experience. Right? Get rid of all those those annoying ads. You can do that easily at patreon.com slash wwe podcast. Um, and and I just as I'm writing this or as I'm speaking, I'm looking at my Facebook page, which I actually I do have one. There is a thing that I have. It's facebook.com slash the WWE podcast. So head on over there. And uh, Curtis Buck, thank you for your comments about the show. Um, it's some very kind words. I'm not going to toot my own horn because I don't. I, I promise my ego is not that big. But uh, I do appreciate the comments. Much, uh, much obliged. And uh, thank you for listening to the show. All righty. Well, guys, we're going to take a quick break. I need to take a breath. 
For those watching on video, it's going to be just like 30 seconds of silence, but it will be, we'll be back after a word from the sponsor, and we're going to dive into Monday Night Raw in a way that is very passionate this week. As tired as I am, I felt very passionate about some certain things, both good, both bad. We're going to start off very at the very beginning after the, um, after the break with the Seth Rollins, Buddy Murphy, Raw Tag Team title win. So stay right here. You're not going to want to miss this. Hey guys, so retirement may or may not be something that you're really thinking about, but even if you are years and years away, I mean, I'm 20 years away from retirement, but it's something that we should all be thinking about. There's a company that has retirement plans that you can invest in precious metals like gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. There's also a big opportunity to grow retirement and grow income for either your personal or, um, or a business. And anyone who signs up at this website receives a free investment kit and gift. So what is this website? It's brightmoneyinvestments.com. That's brightmoneyinvestments.com. You can diversify and grow with metals and cryptos, and you can even talk to someone there to get a better idea of what you should be investing in. So head on over to brightmoneyinvestments.com. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. Thank you for once again joining me and... Uh, so let's get into my thoughts. What did I think about Buddy Murphy, Seth Rollins becoming the new Raw Tag Team Champions? Three words for you. That's it. I loved it. I thought it was a great move. It's a smart move. I had this conversation with a couple of co-hosts over the last uh, week or so, and said, "We, you know, we came up with the the uh, the logic that." Seth doesn't and can't really fit into the title picture right now. The major title picture, the WWE title picture. So with him as a heel, Brock as a heel, it isn't going to work, right? And that puts us at well past Mania because whoever is going to face Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania is going to be a baby face. And if that's the case, they have to have a longstanding run after they win at Mania, which puts it into midsummer before Seth could challenge for the belt. In a logical perspective from a face to baby face, or I'm sorry, from a heel to baby face back to heel champion run and timeline. So if that's the case, putting the belt, the some kind of gold in this faction makes total sense. I think it's brilliant. And let's face it, the Viking Raiders weren't exactly setting the world on fire. They just weren't. And that's not a slight at Eric and Ivar, who are great workers. They have a good presence. Um, a little bit hokey of a gimmick. I'm not a fan of the, the Raiders and you're some kind of like, I, I don't know, nostalgic throwback um, type of Neanderthal gimmick that is a little bit cartoonish. I'm not big on it. it. It it has a little bit of the Ascension flair to it. I don't know why I get that feeling, but they're great workers. And they, I don't know if they ever got a fair shake at really being able to exert their characters to the WWE audience. And maybe that's part of the reason why they never seem to really connect. I think fans respect the work they do. They certainly love all the athletic cartwheels and, and, uh, and typical high-flying acrobatics that you would see from a guy half their size. And I understand that, and it is unique, and the fans seem to love it. Um, but they weren't they haven't connected with fans in a way that you would feel at loss if they lost the championship. You don't feel what they feel in character, right? When you know when they had the gold, I didn't feel a loss when they lost the championships. I felt a gain. In the in the entire WWE environment, because Seth and the AOP, Seth and Buddy Murphy and the AOP now have gold. And they are certainly building heat on this group. I love it. I, I, I just, whoever is in charge of this angle, and I would assume that Paul Heyman has a heavy hand in this, is deserving of a, uh, a handshake and, and some kind of award, right? A slammy. I don't know. But they need whoever's in charge of this needs to continue being in charge of this because they have logically put this together. They've thought this through. Um, Seth still thinking that he's doing the right thing, calling himself the Monday Night Messiah. Although I love that nickname, by the way. Love it. WWE could 
you know, maybe pull back a little on the nickname, mentioning it. I mean, seriously, if you counted, it was mentioned probably 20, 25 times. I don't need that. <laughs> I don't need, and WWE, God, they love nicknames, don't they? They love their nicknames. They can't just ever, they can't just ever just introduce somebody, right? They can't even just introduce somebody with just their name. They have to attach the the, the marketing silly nicknames to everyone. And I think the biggest sinners of this are the announcers. And uh, how many times, and, and you know, you guys know how I feel about this, with Michael Cole, he can't ever just announce, here comes Roman Reigns, right? He has to announce, here comes the big dog. He can't ever just say Roman Reigns. He can't ever just say, here comes Braun Strowman, right? I don't, I mean, occasionally if you use their nickname, I mean, I get it, but that's their name. I don't need their cutesy marketing nickname attached to it. And you may say, well, that's, that's a business. They need to market themselves. Have you ever heard of the law of diminishing returns? There comes a point where more isn't better. More that reaches a point quickly that it becomes less and people get annoyed and they don't, they don't buy it. And they start to get annoyed by how often it's mentioned, like it's being just forced, like, you know, right down their throat. And that's what I feel like WWE has done with almost everyone that they've ever had a nickname for in the history of the PG era. And I I have a problem with that. But the Monday Night Messiah, I like it. I just want them to pull effing back on it. It Just a little mention. I mean... I don't know, self, Seth is self-proclaiming himself that, I love it, it's original, I love the shirt that he has with the stained glass as if he's, you know, a uh, a true descendant from God of of him being the, the savior of Monday nights, I love it, Seth is doing the best work he's done in years, since he's been a heel, that's how good Seth has been, um, especially when at the beginning of Raw, when you had Seth AOP and Buddy Murphy out there. And then you had Kevin Owens and uh, Samoa Joe come out. And then they were backed up by the Viking Raiders. All four of them come down to the ring. And who gets a yellow stripe down their back and exits the ring immediately? Seth Rollins. That's that's a little thing that I love. Because he's the ringleader. He's the head honcho. He is the face of this group. And he just showed his true colors in character. And I loved it. I loved what they did with Seth there. Just that little nuance, that little thing there where you, he doesn't fight with his own soldiers in battle, that he gets a yellow stripe down his back. And when things get too hot, he gets out and he doesn't want to own up to what the consequences are of the things he's done and let other people fight his battles. It's great, uh, great psychology. It's it's just great on every level. I love this group. I don't know what their name is. I would assume that they have to come up with a name. I know that they have the Monday Night Messiah, but that's Seth Rollins on an individual level. They have to come up with some kind of name for this group, I would think. I mean, every group has a name. You have to. So I don't know what it's going to be, but I would assume, and there's rumors floating around too, that there could be a fifth member. I wouldn't put it past them. And, and I mentioned this too on, other, I think my last show, I don't want it to get watered down. So I would stop at five, right? I don't want it to become the corporate ministry or the NWO late years of NWO where everyone was in it. And the corporate ministry that was part of the 90, I think it was 1999. It became the corporate ministry and you had the corporation and the ministry joining forces And it sounds cool until you get all these guys in this big group that you, they're all blended together and nobody's benefiting from being able to get a, get a push because you're all just kind of in this mush of a humanity and that works for a short time, but it can't last long. So my point is, and I don't think they're going to do that with Seth's group, but if it's going to be a fifth member, I would stop at that number. Just don't go further, please. Um, But Hey, I'm loving this whole angle. I can't say enough about Seth's work. Um, th- and and here's something to, again, because I love when things come back to bite the performers that think that they know what the crowd's going to do. And this one's actually directed at uh, at CM Punk. who I lo- Look, I love the guy. And this is not personal beef or anything. But CM Punk and others have said that Seth 
Now, the, the, the crowd turned on Seth, and the ironic part is that when Seth goes heel, they're going to cheer him. I said, no, they're not. No, they're not. Because in the brainwashed version of WWE talent and WWE management, they think people are just being rebellious. Uh, it's a cool thing to do to cheer heels. Uh, it's cool. No, 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 it's not. People don't cheer the cool heels because it's cool to do and they're being rebellious. That's not their motive. That's not their reasoning. If people are cheering a heel, it's because they're being entertaining. So that's actually a reflection on the heel not doing what they should do. Or the heel who is being booked by the agent or management or Vince. Not doing the things that would piss off people. Not doing things that would truly get people angry. And instead worrying about being cool. And worrying about selling shirts. And worrying about being entertaining. That's why people cheer heels. That's why we've seen sometimes people turn heel and then they get cheered because they're so damn entertaining. Look at Chris Jericho at AEW. People still cheer Chris Jericho because he's so effing entertaining. Chris Jericho just oozes, oozes charisma and he can't help it. And that's a, that's a, that's a compliment to him. But when Punk and others said that they're going to boo Seth and cheer him when he turns heel, no, because people truly dislike Seth's babyface character. It flubbed, it flopped. Becky Lynch didn't help. Him leaving the authority, not of his own volition, didn't help. His pandering, the we stuff, the sickening, uh, you and I, and we're together, and we did it, and we, and we, and we, and shut the hell up, Seth. That's all he wanted to say when he was a babyface. Now that he's heel, I said he's not going to get cheered because people genuinely dislike the heel character just as they did when he was with the authority. He's not that character that he was in the authority, but he certainly knows how to piss people off. And he's done it and he's good at it. And he knows how to be a heel. He knows, he understands the psychology. Whoever has booked this thing is, is and, and I'm sure Seth's had a hand in it. I'm sure maybe hell, even Vince has. I wouldn't put it past the old man. And obviously Paul Heyman. So, again, you listen to the reaction. There's no cheers for Seth. People aren't going, ooh, yay, Seth's out here. We love you. You're so entertaining. You're cool. We actually would love to support you, and you're the anti-hero. No. There are no redeeming qualities about Seth. That's been the problem. There have been entertaining, redeeming, funny, or cool parts of being a heel over the last 10 years, which is why people get cheered when they're heel. Because nobody has committed to being truly heel anymore. They're still worried about getting cheers, even though they're getting they're a heel. So Seth has no redeeming qualities. He's a guy that is self-proclaimed to be a Monday Night Messiah. You can't proclaim yourself to be that, right? Who in their right minds as a human being would proclaim themselves to be a savior and call themselves the Messiah, Right? If you're a Christian, you know what the Messiah refers to, right? Think about it. To, to actually have the nerve to call yourself that. And then still believe that you're doing the right thing and it's for the greater good and that he is merciful. And then says one thing and does the opposite. Turns his back to people and tells his henchmen to finish them. You know, is a liar. Uh, it believes that he's still in the right And that everyone needs to follow him or they'll drag him with him or you like all this stuff. All of it is not redeeming. It's, it's, it's just sinister. It's nasty. It's not likable at all. So again, this is a, uh, a really a, a a hand, just complete acclaim for all involved in this story of turning Seth, making him a successful heel it's been great. I've loved it. So I can't say enough. Anyway, I've gone on too much about that, but, uh, so that's a really good thing. How about that? For those people that think all I do is complain, right? (laughs) Uh, I got to give some positivity. I really do. Um, oh, and by the way, by the way, folks, Wichita, Kansas, you're not even worthy of a banner. You're not even worthy of a 3d logo. You are not worthy of anything other than a very brief mention uh, by Paul Heyman. I believe somebody else did mention there in Wichita, but it wasn't an announcer it, or it wasn't a, even a uh, a banner on the screen at the beginning of the show. Somebody did mention there in Wichita. I just can't think of who at the moment. And some of you are going to say, oh, it was so-and-so. And I, I just, again, my recall memory is fading. Uh, but you guys are not worthy of a banner, nor mentioning even what state they're in at the beginning of the show. They didn't even tell you where they were. 
seriously WWE. Seriously. I mean, nobody else is probably thinking this is a big deal. It's just reflective of the corporate culture and the egos that management have and Vince McMahon has to not even to think that they are above the city they're in because it's too country. It's Southern. You know, you know, Vince McMahon does not like Southern culture. He doesn't like the Southern accent. He thinks and has this complex that Southern people are inferior simply because of their draw or their, their, the way that they live their lives or the stereotypes. How many times, I mean, in one of the most entertaining segments on raw, Edge, Christian, Kurt Angle, uh, they were doing some kind of stereotypical country band look. If you remember on Raw, it might have been late 90s, early 2000s. And I think uh, Christian had in some teeth that were disheveled, if you will. Somebody, I think Edge had a straw hat on and uh, Kurt Angle had a banjo. So he loves to play on those stereotypes, but... He genuinely dislikes Southern culture, and you see it because you look at the cities that he's in, and nine times out of ten, when he's in a city that does he does not deem worthy of mentioning because it's not a city that is that's got a lot of history. It's an NFL city, or it's a big uh, metropolitan area. They don't mention it. They don't mention it. And, and you know, I never really seemed to care about this until it was just recently brought up by another podcast. I'll give credit where credit's due. I didn't come up with this, but it is very interesting that when they are in a city that they quote think is not worthy of mentioning or will put out the perception that they are in small markets when they're a huge company, it's all about their ego and their perception to other people. That's the only reason. And imagine the job that somebody has to go into their schedule and go and and just like, nope, nope, uh, not worth mentioning this city. Check, check, check. Nope, don't mention that city. We're not mentioning this city. We're just mentioning the state. We're maybe mentioned, you know, it's like, who does that? And you actually have to audibly tell the announcers, don't mention the city you're in tonight. Right, you have to tell the performers, eh, don't mention the city you're in tonight. Like, what? Who the f does that? Why? Why? There's nothing more than ego there. Okay, I'm done. Let's move on. Let's get to the wrestling stuff. I know you guys are tired of me rambling about that. Um, oh, so onto the Rey Mysterio Andrade match. I thought that was a good match. Some bumps were brutal. Um, Zelina getting herself involved was not unexpected to say the least. She's been keeping him afloat with that uh, United States Championship for uh, weeks now. Uh, and again, Rey Mysterio, as the dumb babyface, gets ousted and outsmarted by Zelina Vega. And you're telling me that he couldn't have simply overpowered her, not struck her, because God forbid a man retaliates against a woman in any kind of physical way. And don't worry, we'll get there to the main event. Rant alert, a uh, rant warning, really. Um, but just the fact that Rey Mysterio is the, this is the second week in a row in which he's been bested by Andrade, and he can't she, he can't just simply just push her out of the way or just reach over her to grab the belt, even if she's standing on the sitting on the ladder. You know, I, I just I don't understand. I, I'm I'm befuddled by that. But the effort was there. Both guys are ultra talented. Uh, Rey Mysterio. I don't think anyone expected this out of the, his, you know, his uh, reun- or reinvigoration or resurrection of his career in WWE. He has certainly done more than I think anyone can ask or think in his second run, if you will, in WWE. It has been a, a pleasure to watch him, and I just don't know what Rey ever did to win or earn a second opportunity at the United States Championship. No one ever said he won a tournament. It was just kind of there. Um, whatever. So Andrade clearly is going to be moving on to uh, another opponent. I would assume that it's going to be Umberto Carrillo because Umberto came out after Ray was about to get DDT'd on the concrete floor and was disguised in a Rey Mysterio mask and attacked Andrade. And uh, so clearly that's where they're headed. And I'm fine with that. Um, I bet Ray could have used him, you know, 30 seconds earlier to save his belt, but they're trying to get into a program with, with Umberto. So Umberto Carrillo is going to be, an, I think, a great opponent for Andrade. They're going to put on some very good matches. Uh, ultimately, do I think Umberto is going to win the United States Championship? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think Umberto's ready for that. 
uh, I would like to see Andrade keep it and keep it and keep it uh, for quite some time. I, I'm a huge fan of long title runs. I just have always been a big fan of title runs that last, you know, four, five, six months plus. Uh, so, all right. Um, moving down the line here is, let's see here, Alistair Black versus an enhancement talent. So, honestly, it's interesting that Alistair Black beats Buddy Murphy, right? Beats him three times in a row, and he's still facing enhancement talent, and Buddy Murphy is at the pinnacle of his career. Just think about that. (laughs) I mean, seriously. like When you think about this, when you look at win-loss records that don't mean a damn thing, uh, you look at these these matches that are supposed to have meaning, that are supposed to have some kind of consequences and reward for winning and losing, and you look at Buddy Murphy, who lost three times in a row to Aleister Black clean, and then he's suddenly the, uh, the you know the uh, second coming of he's with the second coming of Christ, and uh, in, in Seth Rollins, and he's doing the biggest thing he's ever done in his WWE career. Just kind of ironic, right? And Aleister Black is still facing local talent. Is <laughs> Seriously, good God. But, um, okay. Uh, we also had the Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar in ring promo. Um, we uh, got a recap of what happened with R Truth and uh, Lesnar last week. And we have Heyman doing his brilliance on the mic. And he's making a case as to why Lesnar is going to be the last man standing, even if he's coming in at number one. And uh, he said that Lesnar is going to get to choose who, who who he will go up against at WrestleMania as if there's a choice, right? If he wins the Rumble. I already went over that. Um, but before he reveals the name, Heyman asks the crowd, why are they booing Brock Lesnar? Do you think there's anyone worthy of stepping in the ring with Brock Lesnar? Name one. Don't worry. We'll wait. And then Ricochet comes out and uh, stands at the top of the ramp with a very, very... Uh, disingenuous red promo, and it, th- this ugh, it made me it made me dislike Ricochet. I'll tell you that. He uh, begins talking about Heyman, how he comes out every week and talks a lot, and the word "afraid" isn't in his vocabulary. So Heyman says, "Oh, this is where we get it. Obviously, you're edu- you got your education in Wichita. That's the only time we got to know what city we're in by insulting the city you're in again." Um, so whatever, uh, Heyman says Ricochet will end up hurt by Lesnar, but Ricochet continues and says, Brock, I am not afraid to step in that ring with you inches closer, gets in the ring and says that now I'm in the ring. I want you to know that I'm not afraid to challenge you to a fight right now. Oh boy. I mean, so you have Ricochet here who was United States champ. He had a good, good program with AJ Styles and, since really kind of fallen off the map. Comes out, faces Brock Lesnar, and we're supposed to have this respect for him for doing that, right? I don't. I think it's foolish. I don't have respect for Ricochet for acting like a fool. I don't... And and the thing is, Ricochet's type of in-ring style is not my cup of tea because I don't feel anything in his matches. Other than, ooh, that's going to hurt tomorrow. I don't get pulled in emotionally in his matches. His his promo ability is uh, robotic and monotone at, right now. I'm not saying he can't be a great talent. I'm not saying he's not talented. He's ultra-athletic, ultra-talented athletically in the ring. He's got a good look. He's a good-looking dude. But there's no heart. There's no soul to his character. His character is so one-dimensional about just doing these crazy stunts and putting his life on the line every move he does. And with a guy like that, his shelf life is extremely small. Let's be honest. His shelf life is minimal. Because you can't continue to do that to your body night after night after night. And expect Mother Nature to not push back. And beyond that, I'm like, there's nothing to ricochet. And me might say, "What are you talking about? He's one of the best guys on the roster." Okay, if your if your if your definition of best guy in the roster is 
contingent upon you defining great wrestling as spot, 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 fast paced, 1000% pace, go, go, go. 450 splash, I mean, it, it kick to the head, you know, all this, you know, Pele kick, all this stuff. And I know that wrestling's evolved into that in 20, uh, 2020 and 2019, last year. And I understand that. But I just, with all of that, you look to Ricochet as a stunt man. You don't look to Ricochet as a guy you can relate to and get behind and feel something for emotionally. You just don't. You can't tell me you do. Because Ricochet, again, I'm not saying you can't. I'm not ripping on the guy. I'm I'm just not a fan of how his character is structured and how he how we're supposed to get behind him simply because of the cool moves he does. Oh, it's cool. Look at all the great stuff he's doing. Look at all those flops and flops and 450 splashes and reversals. Oh, wow, cool. That's not what gets me into a character. There's no story behind Ricochet. And you come out and he does this very monotone promo. Doesn't get a great reaction. But Brock Lesnar kicks him right in the balls and says, not scared. I love it. It's so Brock. I was behind Brock and I'm still behind Brock. I love Brock Lesnar as champion. I love it. And I'm surprised they're getting the negative reaction they are for Brock. Which is what they're supposed to get because he's positioned as a heel. That's fine. That's fine. But I love Brock Lesnar as as a champion. Love it. I love it. And I think that that is something that is going to be good for whoever takes the belt off him because you're beating a a legitimate, highly credentialed, most celebrated athlete in the history of WWE in terms of actual combat credentials. So I loved it. Uh, I mean, this is great stuff. And it clearly sets up something with uh, Brock and Ricochet if they have an interaction at the Rumble. So, um, and just a quick side note on a theory that I've been thinking about. And this doesn't have anything to do with necessarily who I'm going to pick to win the Rumble. uh, If, again, Roman Reigns is not going to win. And it's they've really done a lot of work building up Brock Lesnar as number one. And then he's going to go through 29 other guys. So my thought is how this could be written, how this could be done. Is Brock Lesnar's number one. You have number two as a guy that is a joke. I wouldn't say enhancement talent, but he's a guy that, you know, is he'd come out and you go, oh my God, he's going to, this guy's going to get killed, right? And Brock tosses him over the rope, tosses number three over the rope, number four, number five. And by the time you get to five, you're going, and the announcers are positioning it as, is there anybody who can come out and stop Brock Lesnar? Because Brock is tossing bodies one after another. And you get to five. Man, hell, maybe you even get to ten. And Brock is just dis- dispatching guy after guy after guy. And then eventually you get a guy that's able to hang with Brock until the next guy comes out and fills the ring and fills the ring. And Brock survives until the last two, three, four guys. So I think that's what's going to happen. Regardless of who, I don't, I don't think Brock's going to win. I don't think. But he's starting to make more of a case to me that he could win. And that's great. That's great they're making me think like this. But I believe that Brock will survive until the end. And I think the beginning of the Rumble, you're going to see something unprecedented of Brock just hauling and, and just tossing guys over the rope because they have made such a big deal about Brock Lesnar being able to do take number one and take it all the way to the end. You have to have Brock in there at the end. You can't have a shock elimination. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, it has to be, I believe, a Brock Lesnar-dominated match. It, it just has to be. I, I just, I believe that. So, Randy Orton versus Drew McIntyre happened next. Um, and I thought this was a good match. You have two veterans in there. Uh, you had the crowd chanting for Randy Orton. And uh, this is kind of back to McIntyre as a heel, I guess. He's still a bit of a tweener, but this week he leaned leaned a little bit more heel. Um, So the the end of the match, as I'm kind of reading it, and I saw it, but I want to make sure that you guys are with me as I'm going through this mentally. Uh, Orton went to the top rope and landed a superplex. McIntyre tried to get to his feet. The OC come running down and settled the score with McIntyre. Uh, Orton begins knocking each of them out with a chair. 
hitting each man, um, and then Orton's still holding the chair and looks to McIntyre, who's standing on his feet. Orton drops the chair and goes face-to-face, walks past him to the ropes, and then Orton shrugs as he hits an RKO on McIntyre, and he exits the ring. So um, that it still puts positions McIntyre is kind of in between, right? Because he's he nobody won this match, number one. Number two, you have him positioned with Orton as kind of that mutual respect, and then Orton turns on McIntyre at the end and hits him with an RKO. It's a weird dynamic with McIntyre. They haven't gone fish or foul with him yet. Um, so, interesting. It's an interesting, uh, interesting matchup. So, we get Charlotte Flair again. Charlie asks Charlotte about her confidence going into the Rumble. Charlotte says... I'm always confident, but I'm also prepared to face anyone or anything. And Flair paused as Becky Lynch stands next to her, then continues to walk by, and Flair continues, Last year I was eliminated by someone that wasn't even supposed to be in the match, which was Becky Lynch. This year I'm ready to win. Woo. Now, I haven't said a whole lot about the Women's Rumble. What I will say is that I think Charlotte's going to make a much bigger impact in the Rumble than she has in the last four months of being on WWE TV. Charlotte Flair has gone by the wayside, and I think that's all going to change at the Rumble. It has to. Uh, Flair has taken a back seat for quite some time, almost just kind of telling her to sit and wait for her, whoever her opponent's going to be. Could it be Nia Jax, which is why they've been waiting? I don't know. But I think you will see a big impact from Charlotte Flair at the Rumble to kind of give her career a shot in the arm that it desperately needs right now. Um, So that's just my thought on that. Then we had uh, Becky Lynch and Kyrie Sane. And, you know, I, I, I love Kyrie Sane from the perspective of she's one of the best workers that WWE has in the female division. Um, but I understand why they're positioning her as just the sidekick of Asuka because Asuka is the one that's beaten Becky Lynch fair and square, and she beat her at last year's Royal Rumble. So clearly you know that if you're heading into a pay-per-view, this is just WWE rules, law, that if you're heading into a pay-per-view, that someone that doesn't have a match at the pay-per-view is facing you, you automatically win to make you look stronger because you have to be as strong as possible heading into the pay-per-view. I have no problem with that logic. I really don't. I'm not I'm not complaining about it, but you just know what's coming. So Becky ends up defeating Asuka here, or I'm sorry, defeating Kyrie Sane. And uh, this match wasn't as good as some of the matches they've had in the past. And maybe they didn't have as much time to uh, fill with this and uh, Becky Lynch wins. What I didn't understand was this Oscar is sitting on the top rope, like the ring post. Why, why is she standing on the ring post? And why is the referee, even the King, I think brought this up. Why the hell is she allowed to stand there when you have managers get yelled at by the referee for standing on the ring apron and it causes a distraction, and the manager helps that person win. Why is Asuka allowed to stand on the rope, on the, on the ring post? I've never seen that in my life, nor should it ever be allowed in a simulated sport. Like, what, what the hell? You could have done that spot much differently and not had the referee look like a buffoon and have the match just completely discredited because of that stunt. I, I don't know. I... I It's not a huge sticking point, but it was very weird, and it was distracting, and it made no sense from a um, referee standpoint, right? Okay. We had a Rocky Johnson tribute, by the way, which I'm fine. Uh, I don't don't have a whole lot to say about Rocky Johnson um, because I never watched him. Uh, Before my time, I mean, you're talking about the 80s. I was born in the 80s, so... If he won the, or he came into WWE in the 1982, that was three years before I was even thought of. So I didn't have a whole lot to say about Rocky Johnson. I mean, I just don't, other than, I mean, I did read that he had, um, and The Rock revealed it, basically a, a clot that went to his lungs and he had a massive heart attack and died. Um, so I, you know, I, I feel for The Rock, I feel for his family. Um, I, you know, I condolences go out to them and all, you know, all the, the typical thoughts and prayers, but it's true. I mean, I do feel for them. Um, I feel for the family. I feel for you know everybody that's in, affected, involved in family and all that and friends. But uh, I never watched Rocky Johnson. 
I, I just I, I didn't. I'm not going to pretend I did. Other than the clips that you guys and we all saw in the tribute, it was just before my time. It just was. And uh, the Soul Patrol with Tony Atlas, <laughs> that kind of is a good name. Um, I know loosely some of the things Tony Atlas has done, and there's a whole documentary on Tony Atlas and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I don't know. You know, in, in my free time that if I ever get in my life, I would love to go back and watch the, the Soul Patrol and uh, more of the career of Rocky Johnson. But uh, certainly it's a tough time and uh, for everyone involved and everyone affected. I mean, it's just, it just is, you know, I may, I may seem like a, a, a bitter SOB at times about the product, but look, I understand it's just playing in the sandbox and this is real life. So, um, all right. Well, then we got obviously the main event, which I've already discussed and we had Buddy Murphy and Seth Rollins win, which was, or I'm sorry, that wasn't the main event. That was not the main event. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was not the main event. We, I mean, I've already talked about the tag team title win. But good Lord, good God, the main event of Raw uh, was Bobby Lashley and Lana versus <sighs> Rusev and Liv Morgan. So what? Oh, and by the way, Matt Hardy versus Eric Rowan with Eric Rowan winning. Uh, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, Eric Rowan continues to win. And <laughs> that's it. I just wanted to acknowledge that the match happened. Uh, I don't know what to make of it with Matt Hardy kind of floating out there. Uh, maybe he's they're waiting for Jeff to get healthy. Uh, but I don't know if he'll ever be back. Uh, so, okay. Um, so, yeah, we got this lovely main event that took place in where, WWE? Wichita, Kansas. Say it with me now. Wichita, Kansas. Not just Kansas. No, where specifically? I mean, Kansas is a, a sizable state. Where where in Kansas are you? Just come on. You can tell me. Wichita, right? Oh, God. So we had this match. And to be honest, I mean, this was the, the match that I think we all believe they were building to after the wedding. And we had Liv attack Lana. And you had Rusev attack Bobby. You said, oh, tag match is coming. Well, we got it. And Lana in the ring, I will say before I, you know... Um, say other things. Lana was noticeably improved in the ring. I, you know, I was a little bit harsh on Lana when she first got into the ring and had her match. I think it was against Naomi, and she was not great. You know, she she was clearly green, um, and didn't show a whole lot of fire. And she was clearly four steps behind the rest of the roster, women's roster. So I will give props where props are due that Lana clearly has done some in-ring work. So props to her and smart of her to get better in the ring. Um, but then you had this whole thing where, you know, uh, you have the women slapping the men and attacking the men and they can't retaliate against the women because, oh, oh well, 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 we don't do that. Oh, well, it's domestic violence. Huh? I mean, come on. I mean, seriously, I just I'm befuddled as to why that is right What's that promoting? Well, look at this, guys. This is a simulated sport, right? It's a PG product, which means parental guidance is suggested. So if you see a woman attack a man on TV in, in professional wrestling and the man retaliates, well, it's pro wrestling, right? Well, what kind of message is that sending? First of all, if you are concerned about pro wrestling educating your kids, maybe you should be a parent and educate your kids and not allow wrestling to do so, right? If And number two, you can always turn the damn thing off and go watch Paw Patrol, right? Or something like that if you're that worried about it. Or, I don't know, whatever. What do the kids watch these days? Blue's Clues is... No, that Blue's Clues is, like, way too old. Um, but my, my point is, I, I just... I, I don't understand the, 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 you know, I have a magical shield, glowing shield around me because I'm a female, I'm a woman. You can't touch me, but damn it, I'm going to be able to beat the hell out of you. It's garbage. It's crap. It's frustrating as a fan. Um, I miss the Attitude Era days where, you know, if the women attacked the men, you knew the women were going to get theirs. I mean, look at what they did to Stephanie McMahon. Stephanie McMahon has taken some great bumps. And I love the thing. She's taken stunners. She's taken a rock bottom. She's taken a pedigree. 
I mean, Stephanie McMahon has put herself out there, and it's deserving at times. Stephanie McMahon even got speared by Roman Reigns, right? So when it's deserving, it's people love it. I don't think people would would honestly, unless it's over the top, and you you know you're beating a woman down with a chair and she's bloody. I mean, that that's a little too much. But look, an eye for an eye here, and just because you're a woman does not give you automatic immunity to assault a man. And oh, you can't touch me; I'm a woman. F you. Look, number one, it's pro wrestling, okay? It's even double bad in pro wrestling because it's a fantasy environment that you are trying to tell a story in. But with all these sponsors and all these people and activist groups and, oh, my God, the women, oh, my God, we'd have people screaming, at, knocking at the doors. Grow a set, okay? Grow a set and and do the thing that you would that should be done. I just don't understand that. And if it's a mixed tag match and the women can only compete with the women and the men can only compete with the men, well, guess what? If the men, or, or excuse me, the women attack the men, that should be a disqualification because that's the rules of the match. Those are the rules of the match. So I just don't understand it. Nonetheless, Rusev ends up losing for the third time to Bobby Lashley. Three times. Three. Yeah. Uh, to Bobby Lashley and Liv and uh, Rusev lose. And we go off the air. I don't know the end game here. I don't know the end game because they're doing a... Look, look I'm, I'm done with this angle. I'm done with Lana in her weird cadence and her screaming and her just trying to be this obnoxious, over-the-top, uh, annoying... You know what? I, I'm, she's not good at promos. She's just not. She doesn't, she doesn't have the right zingers. She doesn't. She just is talking, and she can't find the words. And she comes up with weird words, and it's uncomfortable. It's not fun to watch. I, it's trash TV, but now it's starting to become bad trash TV. And and not just that, but this story needs to end, and it needs to end with the victory of the babyface. And we've seen three straight shots, uh, three straight losses with Rusev now and it's uh, I don't know Rusev is being damaged by this as well now so uh I don't know um, so I don't mean to end on a down note but uh that's really the main event of Raw not a tag team title match that is the main event of Raw I mean it's building good heat I guess for Lana and Bobby but give us a damn payoff here it's three in a row that Lash, uh, Rusev has lost so I, I I don't know give us a damn end Please, with Rusev on top, and you know maybe he can put Rus- she, or Rusev can put Lana in the accolade and make her scream. I don't know. I don't. Know. That's why I would book it. Boy, good thing I'm not in charge of a wrestling company. I'd have so many lawsuits and spot drop sponsors, and <laughs> it would be a financial disaster. But boy, I'd have fun for like a couple months. Um, but. All right, guys. Well, uh, that's my Raw review. Those of you on video, thank you for joining me. You can head on over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast if you'd like to get yourself on the video feed and get yourself ad-free experience to everything. Shout out on the show, video shout out on Twitter, uh, lots of other cool stuff. And um, uh, it's it's, it's been a blast. Um, And don't forget, I have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash the WWE podcast. Um, I hope that you will join me there. Give us a like. I'm also on Instagram at WWE Podcast, uh, on Twitter, every social media at the WWE Podcast, right? I'm on CastBox. I'm on Apple. I'm on Spreaker. I'm on SoundCloud. Or, no, not SoundCloud. I'm on Stitcher. I'm on uh, TuneIn. I'm on Radio.com, iHeartRadio. I mean, pretty much you name it. Uh, so give us a like and rating and review if you are so inclined. And uh, I want to thank you guys for joining. I want to thank you guys for watching. A big week coming tomorrow, don't forget, is going to be my part one of the Stone Cold versus The Rock saga at WrestleMania 15. Big, big, big pay-per-view at that uh, that time, a, a landmark pay-per-view, especially um, with Jim Ross returning from his bout of Bell's Palsy. I'll give my thought on that. Um, so lots to cover. So much coming up this week. It's Rumble Week. WrestleMania season is here. It's time to get excited. It's time to come back and tell your non-wrestling fans that it's WrestleMania season, so it's almost time to be socially accepted as a wrestling fan. Uh, we all know how that goes as the off-season wrestling fans. So, uh, guys, thanks so much for joining. I'll talk to you next time. Hey, guys. So, retirement may or may not be something that you're really thinking about, but... 
even if you are years and years away, I mean, I'm 20 years away from retirement, but it's something that we should all be thinking about. There's a company that has retirement plans that you can invest in precious metals like gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. There's also a big opportunity to grow retirement and grow income for either your personal or, um, or a business. And anyone who signs up at this website receives a free investment kit and gift. So what is this website? It's brightmoneyinvestments.com. That's brightmoneyinvestments.com. You can diversify and grow with metals and cryptos, and you can even talk to someone there to get a better idea of what you should be investing in. So head on over to brightmoneyinvestments.com.